This episode is brought to you by Oblivion Black by Darren Floyd. What are people saying about Oblivion Black? Brilliantly written, engaging, a story well told, five stars. This is a truly brilliant post-apocalyptic read, five stars. Could not put this book down, and I was so sad when it ended, five stars. A sanctuary built for the ultra-elite to shield against the apocalypse. Then the murders begin. Something else is in there. It always has been. Acclaimed horror writer Tim Levin said of the book, In Oblivion Black, Floyd introduces us to a frightening future that's too close for comfort, and a sanctuary where no sane person would wish to hide. Original, disturbing, and exciting, it's a novel that's itching to hit the big screen. Oblivion Black is out now for Kindle and as a paperback from Amazon. It does not do to trust people too much. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, The Yellow Wallpaper. Welcome to Books in the Freezer, a podcast dedicated to the deliciously disturbing world of horror fiction. I'm your host, Stephanie, and today I'm joined by the lovely Emma Olton. You may know her from her YouTube channel, Drinking by My Shelf. And today we're going to be chatting about psychological horror. That's right. Hi. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, welcome to the show. I'm so excited you're here. I've been listening a lot recently to kind of prepare so it feels like very strange being on the other side now. <laughs> I get that. Um, I love your YouTube channel. You crack me up all the time. <laughs> Thank you. You also like get so committed to things in a way that just like astounds me. Like you'll read a whole series in like a weekend. And I'm just like, how? How yeah, is this possible? <laughs> it's too much. I don't know. <laughs> People always leave me comments like, oh, you're so energetic and you seem so smiley. And I'm like, I just turned the camera off and then like screamed into a pillow. Like, <laughs> no one's having fun here. <laughs> Let's get real. I think my favorite one that you did was the one where you spoiled like thrillers because I felt like it was just such a service to the community because there's a lot of thrillers that I'm like I don't feel like I want to really devote my time to that but I also yeah. do want to know what the twist is so thank okay. you okay I'm glad <laughs> that you liked that yeah I'm a bit I love spoilers even if books that I'm gonna read or like movies I'm gonna watch I just love spoilers I like go on wikipedia and read an entire movie plot synopsis and then watch the movie it's weird do you feel like you're more relaxed that way like watching the movie I think so. I read an article once saying that spoilers like genuinely increase people's enjoyment of something, and I just took that to heart and was like, I'm going to spoil everything before I <laughs> consume it. That's interesting. I feel like there's a lot of people that do that. I think with horror movies too, like some people want to just like enjoy the movie and not be like flinching the whole time. So yeah. I know there's people that do that. I'm yeah. curious to see how many listeners are on team like spoilers. Yeah, because it's divisive. Some people absolutely hate it. Oh, but yeah. yeah, with horror movies, definitely. I have, if I want to watch something scary because I'm so jumpy and I hate jumping, I will watch it on mute first and then I will watch it with the sound on <laughs> because then I know roughly when things are going to happen. We were talking about this before recording, but um, watching things on laptops with headphones is like probably the most intense viewing experience. And that's how I watched all the paranormal activity movies in college with my roommate and I was so jumpy that she would turn the volume way up when we knew that a jump scare was coming and she would like hold me down and make me like listen to That is to it. evil. That's so mean. But I think it's to this day why I'm convinced they're like the most terrifying movies ever. And yeah. a lot of seasoned horror fans were like, eh. Like, <laughs> but you, you just had understand. like the most intense experience. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So we're here to talk about psychological horror, which is like a huge and super popular subgenre within horror. 
And I know there's like a big divide between like psychological horror and psychological thriller. So do you think there's a difference between the two or like how would you define it? That's interesting. I was worried. I was wondering if you were going to ask me that because I kind of wanted to know your thoughts as well. Um, (laughs) Because I've been kind of Googling to try and figure out the difference. Um, A definition that I read, um, when I read a couple that were interesting, one of them said... Psychological horror is a specific genre of horror that investigates the effect of terror on the mind. Psychological thrillers are more about the sort of fear human psychology can create for others. So Hmm. um, there's kind of a difference there. Um, And then in general, like horror versus thriller, a definition I read was that horror is a seemingly inevitable doom where the climax of the movie is either getting away or stopping the evil. And then a thriller is a tension filled story that's not predictable where the climax is the revealing of the real evil. So it's kind of, I feel like very subtle differences there. And like in reality, there's a lot more overlap than those definitions kind of suggest. Yeah, and it's tough. And I mean, we've talked about this on the podcast a lot, like how it's so hard to just like pinpoint where things are. And sometimes something like feels like a thriller and sometimes something just like feels like it's horror. But it's Mm -hmm. hard to like nitpick the pieces. And like one thing I saw a lot was psychological horror is based mostly with the mental state of the main character and the protagonist. Like that's what plays a huge part in it. And I... I don't know about you. I had such a hard time coming up with things for this because I would pick a book and then be like, no, but do we focus on the psychological state of that character? And then I take it yeah. and like, this one instead. Um, yeah, I think it's really, it's like a blurry genre. And I kind yes. of interpret the psychological both ways in it because it's it's about the psychological state of the character, like you said. But then I also, maybe the difference between psychological thriller versus horror for me personally I don't know if this is a real definition but for me um is that when it's horror it messes with my psychological state as well Mm. so I'm feeling creeped out and it's different from regular horror I'm not feeling creeped out because I think there's a clown under my bed but I'm feeling creeped out because I'm not trusting my mind anymore yeah and I feel like there's a lot like even within the blurry genre there's I feel like the very succinctly told novellas where like the big thing is a twist like that's the psychological horror of it is like actually it was da 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 the whole time yeah or sometimes it really is just that we are following this person that is going through something that is psychologically traumatizing and we are in their head yeah. for this experience yeah exactly so it's so like I'm, there's yeah there's a lot under the umbrella <laughs> there's a lot yeah of the books that I chose there's kind of the range so there's like Misery is more just kind of, it's about like the psychological state of those two main characters. And then some of the other ones I've chosen more kind of go into that ambiguous, like, is it supernatural or is it not? Because there's kind of this Mm -hmm. twist where you don't know which is scarier, whether either it's ghosts and that's scary or there's no ghosts. And that's almost even more terrifying because then what's been going on the whole time? Yeah, Like, I know Psycho is a big one that gets mentioned. And the only reason I didn't choose it for this episode is because the episode that's coming out before this is an episode that is just about Psycho. (laughs) So I didn't want to do two in a row. (laughs) I've never read any of them. Psycho 1 is... I keep calling it. It's just Psycho. I just call it Psycho (laughs) Psycho 1 1. because I just read the whole trilogy and that's how I had to refer to it. Um, Psycho is like a very effective psychological horror book because it's a novella I feel like most of us going into it know what the twist is like what's Mm -hmm. gonna happen but it's still told so well and keeps the tension and keeps the terror like in such a masterful way it's such a good like psychological horror novel (laughs) yeah yeah I'll have to check it out and I heard like the rumors that Alfred Hitchcock like tried to buy all of the copies of them so that nobody could know the twist before the movie, which is great. Which I had never heard that until the person last time on the last episode brought that up. And I was like, that's crazy. But Disclosure, I don't know if it's true or not. It's just one of those like rumors that I've heard. They told it to me like it was true. So I think just own it like it's the truth. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to tell it to people like it's the truth regardless. We're just perpetuating this urban legend, this rumor. (laughs) So yeah, and I know this is um, a topic that's been requested a lot, but I feel like a lot of the like main books that people think about 
are books that have been talked about a lot on the podcast so like and I just mentioned Psycho was just talked about Mm -hmm. um I'm thinking of ending things we've talked about like all the time like a head full of ghosts like I think most Paul Tremblay books kind of fall into this psychological horror umbrella so there was just a few that I think like when you look up psychological horror they're going to be the first ones that pop up like Shirley Jackson Mm -hmm. we have always lived in the castle the haunting of Hill House and those types of things but I kind of wanted to go in a different direction and at least mention them here so that we are acknowledging them that those are psychological horror books but I wanted to pick something a little lesser known that we hadn't talked about do you get a lot of comments i always get this on videos whatever list i make there'll be comments from people saying why didn't you include this one it's like because i i only put nine on the list (laughs) i can't put every book in this genre in the world i do to a degree sometimes they're like not as snarky i do get the snarky ones like now and then but i get like you know what else would be a great addition is this one which is a little more helpful those are nice and helpful yeah, we are people. We haven't read every single book in existence ever. We are not yeah. human encyclopedias. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I get more, I would say, is comments mad that there's repeat. Oh, really? Like recommendations on episodes. So I try really hard not to do repeat. So with my caveat that one of my picks is a repeat, but it's the first time I'm recommending it. Like Rachel had recommended it and a guest had recommended it. But technically, it's the first time it's my recommendation. Okay, that definitely counts. And so speaking, and we always talk about movies that also fall under this umbrella of horror. So of course, Psycho would also fit mm-hmm. into that. Yeah, I have seen that one. <laughs> it's a classic. It's been a yeah. while since I saw it, actually. I haven't revisited either. I mentioned on last episode, I saw it at a sleepover when I was in like junior high and I Mm -hmm. have not seen it since. Uh, But yeah, no, Psycho is great. And that one scared me before I'd even ever seen it. I just had heard about it. And I remember as a teenager, I got really scared of taking showers and I'd never even seen the movie Psycho just because I'd heard about the shower scene. So whenever I was in the shower, which is, you know, like a daily occurrence, so you don't want to be terrified that often. I was like constantly ripping back the curtain to be like, is there somebody there? (laughs) And actually it was only when I saw the movie that I then got over it because almost like you build up in your head too much. And then when you see the movie, you're like, okay, it's okay. That was an actress. Everything's fine. (laughs) I love that you're peeking around the curtain like, I'm ready for you. Yeah, you're yeah, like, I know you're coming. Nope. <laughs> like, even if I saw them, what am I going to do against a guy with a knife? But it's like, I can see you. <laughs> you thought you were going to catch me by surprise. You are wrong, sir. Yeah. You are wrong. <laughs> the things that we think about. Um, <laughs> there's also Silence of the Lambs dealing with a lot of psychological states of, like, Hannibal Lecter and psychoanalyzing buffalo bill or who we find out later is buffalo bill Mm -hmm. yeah that's a great movie one of my favorites and it's 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 weird that it's one of my favorites because i'm a wimp um i'm very squeamish i don't like gory things but for some reason this movie just i don't know spoke to my soul and i've seen it so many times (laughs) um and i remember when i was growing up because me and my mom are both complete wimps when it comes to movies and she had seen science of the lambs uh, like years before and she had always said to me don't watch Silence of the Lambs it's the scariest film in the world I mean it's not the scariest film in the world but she said it's the scariest film in the world don't watch it never watch it and I remember one time when I was a teenager calling her and literally all I did like she picked up the phone and I was like I've done something bad which you would think as a mother to a teenager you'd be like oh my god are you pregnant yeah. are you on drugs what's happened and she went you watched Silence of the Lambs didn't you Like, she just knew me. And I was like, yes, I did. (laughs) But I loved it. So I disagreed with her. And now I just watch it on repeat. That's funny. It's one of those movies that walks that line between horror and thriller, where people are constantly fighting over, like, which camp it belongs in, Mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Yeah. It is kind of both. And I also think people... I mean, you have maybe talked about this before, but... I think there's sometimes some snobbery with the horror versus thriller and people try and claim something as thriller because they think it makes it more highbrow in a way. They're like, oh no, I don't, I didn't like this horror movie. It's a thriller. But like, it's, it's both. It can be both. And one isn't better than the other. I see that a lot on like book lists and publishing things like all these great thrillers. I'm like, "Mm, that's a, that's a horror novel. Yeah. 
like in a lot of like book podcasts I listen to, it's like, I feel like there's always like that caveat, like I don't like horror or I don't like really read scary books, but here's these like horrifying thrillers. I don't know. Yeah. It just kind of. <laughs> yeah. People like to put themselves in boxes, but everyone likes a little bit of horror sometimes. I really think they do. But anyway, we need to talk about some books. <laughs> Let's talk about some books. Yeah. <laughs> From the host of This Is Horror Podcast comes a dark thriller of obsession, paranoia, and voyeurism. After relocating to a small coastal town, Brian discovers a hole that gazes into his neighbor's bedroom. Every night she dances and he peeps. Same song, same time, same wild and mesmerizing dance. But soon Brian suspects he's not the only one watching and she's not the only one being watched. Their watching is the Wicker Man meets Body Double with a splash of Suspiria. They're Watching by Michael David Wilson and Bob Pastorella is available from thisishorror.co.uk, Amazon, and wherever good books are sold. So my first book is a book that came out this year, and this is The Unsuitable by Molly Poleg. This, I'm giving a trigger warning for loss of a parent and self-mutilation, and I mean like a lot of it, like it's a constant thing. Okay. So Isolde Wentz is a Victorian woman perniciously close to spinsterhood whose distinctly unpleasant father is trying to marry her off. She's awkward, she's plain, and most pertinently, she believes that her mother, who died in childbirth, lives in the scar on her neck. Isolde's father parades a host of unsuitable candidates before her, the majority of whom Isolde wastes no time in frightening away. When at last her father finds a suitor desperate enough to take Isolde off his hands, a man whose medical treatments have turned his skin silver, a true comedy of errors ensues. As history's least conventional courtship progresses into talks of marriage, Isolde's mother becomes increasingly volatile, uncontrollable, and Isolde is forced to resort to extreme, often violent measures to keep her in check. As the wedding day nears, she must decide whether and how to set the course of her life with increasing interference from both her mother and father tipping her ever closer to madness and to an inevitable devastating final act. Wow. This is a really interesting book. So it's set in the Victorian era. And even though it is, I feel like it does touch upon a lot of modern sensibilities and anxieties when it comes to being a woman. I know within the story, it's framed that she's like becoming very close to spinsterhood and her dad just like really needs to get her off of his hands so that he is no longer responsible for her but right. she keeps like sabotaging all of these attempts to get herself married off because she just tells everyone um like when it's time to meet the parents she decides that that's the time to tell everyone that she hears her mother she still talks to her <laughs> inside of a scar that's on her neck and uh-huh. it works all the time <laughs> yeah uh-huh totally um, normal and I don't know. This was really interesting. It was it had a kind of a gothic feel to it. And we see a lot of abusive gaslighting tactics from the voice that is her mother, which is like the voice in her head and in the book. It's very interesting, like the different ways that the voice talks to her and how it becomes more and more abusive as it's threatened. And mother is very threatened by the idea of her getting married off and becoming someone's wife and she's hearing all of this she's also hearing um abusive comments from her father it's just tough all around for results yeah um so there is a bit of body horror because as the synopsis says she uses violent measures to keep that voice in check and this is about a woman who basically has no control over her life and i really liked it um sounds great (laughs) sounds very strange and the stranger the better when it comes to horror i think it is definitely very strange i will say it's not for everyone um i am gonna rate this it's between room temperature and fridge i mean it's a little slow going it's definitely a period piece even though 
there is a little bit of a modern voice to it. It's definitely set when it is set. It takes a bit mm-hmm. to get going, and there are passages of body horror as she self-harms to try to quell the voice of her mother to the point where her lady's maid has to just kind of hide anything that's sharp from her. And part of her thing is like trying to find ways to pilfer sharp objects. It's kind of a whole thing. Yeah. That's played off. Um, so I thought it was an interesting and timely addition to kind of the gothic genre so that is unsuitable by molly pollock oh i'll definitely check that one out that sounds fun well not fun it sounds horrifying (laughs) but (laughs) but horrifying is fun yeah um okay so the first book that i was going to talk about is the yellow wallpaper by charlotte perkins gilman which is one that i read at university and i think a lot of people probably read at school or university Um, So in this one, this woman and her husband and new baby have come to a really nice house for a holiday and it's revealed that she has depression, most likely postnatal depression, and her husband, who is also her doctor, is very belittling of this illness. So he has prescribed her the rest cure, which was a real thing, and the author, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, was prescribed it herself and had terrible effects from it. But basically she's told to live as domestic and passive a life as possible so she can't work she can't write it's kind of this form of torture she just is supposed to lie in bed and do absolutely nothing so she is secretly hiding it from her husband doctor um, but secretly writing in this journal and it's through the journal that we get to see her become more and more convinced that the house is haunted And she thinks that a woman is trapped behind the yellow wallpaper and is like creeping around behind there. It's genuinely very scary imagery. And she ends up as the, it's a short story, it's a novella. Um, She ends up as the novella goes on sort of becoming the woman in the wallpaper. And at the end, even her husband like faints from shock at the sight of her crawling around this room, like drawing on the walls. Um, So it's about her kind of psychological state kind of completely deteriorating. So I read it at university and to me and the rest of us in the class, it was very much like this is a horror story about this woman's mental state completely deteriorating from enforced rest, from the rescue. She's made entirely passive and she completely loses her shit. Um, And that to me at the time was a very clear reading of it. Like it is ambiguous and there could be a supernatural element, but the ambiguity is really important in it. But apparently when it was first published, which was in 1892, a lot of readers interpreted it as a straight up ghost story, which is really funny to me. Like a lot of them did not (laughs) even consider that the treatment could be bad for this woman. They just were like, oh wow, there was a woman in the wallpaper and everything else is fine. Like the rest cure was helpful. It wasn't the doctor's fault there was a woman in the wallpaper, Um, which is very funny. Um, But it's, yeah, it's this very, very interesting, ambiguous story. It's a very feminist story. The critic Alan Ryan, for example, introduced it by saying, quite apart from its origins, it is one of the finest and strongest tales of horror ever written. It may be a ghost story, worse yet, it may not, which I think sums it up so well, that kind of, you don't know which is scarier. Is there a woman in the wallpaper, or is she becoming convinced that she is the woman in the wallpaper? Is that just the most terrifying thing? I think it's great, it's a classic for a reason, and it is terrifying as well because that was true. Women were prescribed the rest cure and they were forced into this completely debilitating state, which is like the real life horror of it. Um, so, I mean, my ratings are going to be different because like I said, I'm a wimp, so I feel like everything is like going in the freezer for me, but it's not, I'll give it like a room temperature because it's not terrifying in the way that like big horror readers will find terrifying. It's creepy, eerie imagery rather than like absolutely terrifying scenes. It's more of like a slow burn. Like once you finished it and the more you think about it, it's more of like a chill that settles on you thinking about the the real context of it. Like that. <laughs> this is a big blind spot for me. Like I no, this is a book that gets assigned a lot at schools. I, for some reason, never had to read it, but I, like, definitely know of it, and its reputation precedes the story. I mean, it's a very famous short story, and I, I mean, I knew the plot, but it does sound interesting, so I think I'm going to check it out, finally. Yeah. Finally get around to I definitely recommend it. Yeah, we did it in a module at university that was called Madness and Medicine, which I took just mm-hmm. because the name of the module was so good. Um, And it was very interesting. I mean, there were all of these theories we learned about that I will not 
do justice now because it's been like 10 years um but it was kind of we we looked at madness and gender so we looked at books like the yellow wallpaper and then also we looked at a lot of books that were set in world war one and were about shell shock and it was kind of all about like the impact of gender on mental health and the, these like hysteria versus shell shock being a very female mental health problem and it and shell shock being a very male one and then looked at how actually quite similar they are even though they're seen as these two completely different things it was very interesting and there are people who can talk about it in great depth but i'm not one of those people that sounds absolutely fascinating though it's 100 percent a class i would have signed up for oh yeah it was great Okay, so my next pick is another weird one. I felt like I went really weird this episode, which is good, but sometimes it's kind of hard to describe these like really weird stories. So yeah. anyway, here I go. Um, I picked Tinfoil Butterfly by Rachel E. Moulton. There's a lot of trigger warnings for this one. So child abuse, loss of a child, self-harm, suicide, mental illness, substance abuse, and addiction. So we follow Emma, who is hitchhiking across the U.S. trying to outrun a violent, tragic past. She meets up with Lowell, who's this dumb, hot driver that she hopes is going to take her as far as the Badlands. But he's not as harmless as he seems, and there's a vicious scuffle that leaves Emma bloody and stranded in an abandoned town in the Black Hills, which is in South Dakota, with an out-of-gas van, a loaded gun, and a snowstorm on the way. The town is eerily quiet, and Emma takes shelter in a diner where she stumbles across Earl, who is a strange little boy wearing a tinfoil mask, who steals her gun before begging her to help him get rid of George. As she's pulled deeper into Earl's bizarre, menacing world, the horrors of Emma's past creep closer, and she realizes she can't run forever. I really liked this book this book was such a mind trip though like as I was reading it I'd be like whoa (laughs) (laughs) um so yeah it opens up with her hitching a ride with this guy and then they get into this very as it does like a vicious scuffle she like beats the crap out of him and like barely gets away with her life as she stumbles into this diner it's just very dreamlike she meets up with Earl who we learn is a trans boy and he is telling her that he needs her help to get rid of his stepdad who is around. And it's just so eerie. And as she is dealing with Earl and helping Earl, we get flashbacks to what her past is that she is running away from and why she is going where she is going. And this book was really interesting. It is super dark. It is very, very dark. And it definitely has one of those things where... I feel like you don't really even know what is reality and what is not reality and what is something that she is imagining, what could possibly be supernatural. Like this has very almost Lovecraftian elements. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It had such a beautiful lyrical writing sprinkled in there along with all this like very dark and heavy and brutal stuff that is happening that I just, I don't know. I This was just one of those books I was reading and I thought about after I finished it for a while like it really crept up into my brain and kind of stayed there for a bit yeah um so I would say this is fridge with definitely some freezer moments it's super dark it has a lot of just dark content just all around just her dealings with Earl just her dealings with where she is coming from and what she has gone through just all around a very dark But I don't know. I really I really liked it. And like I said, it had really good writing. But um, this is definitely one of those dreamlike kind of bizarre, uneven. I'm trying to think of another word other than bizarre, but kind of (laughs) strange, like fever dreamy type stories. Yeah. Um, So that is Tinfoil Butterfly by Rachel Eve Moulton. Just the image of a of a little boy in a tinfoil mask. That is already very creepy yeah. image. Any, anything with kids is always terrifying, isn't it? That's true. They just add that like level of. <laughs> yeah, and why is that? Because kids in real life are cute, and then in books and movies, kids are creepy. <laughs> why is that? I don't know. I think it's capitalizing on how like honest kids are. Like my son is really cute, but sometimes he says like weird stuff that's just like, 
what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like kids just like think out loud. So they're like, what would we look like without skin? What do you think it feels <laughs> like to die? And it's like, oh, You're like, oh, God. God. Yeah. <laughs> I used to sleepwalk as a kid, so I think I probably terrified my parents a lot. Just, like, suddenly I would be in their room, but, like, with unfocused <laughs> eyes. And they'd be like, oh, God, she's haunting us. <laughs> Go away. Did you do, like, the paranormal activity thing where you, like, swayed back and forth? <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> I, I went to a boarding school as well, and I, I used to terrify people there by sleepwalking. <laughs> and I would, like, take apart their room. I would, like, come into people's rooms and start taking things down off the shelves and they'd be like, what is she doing? She's possessed. Or I would just climb into their bed and be like, get out. And they would have to go find somewhere else to sleep. <laughs> okay, so the next book I'm going to talk about is The Apartment by S.L. Gray. S.L. Gray is actually a um, pseudonym for a writing duo, but I can't remember their real names. But S.L. Gray is how they are known. Um, so this is a house swap story. So it's about a couple who have a home invasion at their home in, I think they live in Johannesburg. Um, So they have this really terrifying experience. They decide to get away from it and they book a house swap, like in the holiday, but much less cute because it's a horror book. Um, So they go to what is supposed to be this luxury apartment in Paris, but when they get there, it is this completely horrible little grotty flat in a really rundown building, like very obviously the second they arrive, this is not where they were supposed to be. And they also find out that the people who were supposed to go to there apartment back in Johannesburg never showed up. So it's a creepy start and then it just gets weird from there. I literally had to hide on my bed while I was reading it and have my dog be with me at all times. She's curled up next to me right now and I just like would not let her leave. I had to get her to come with me if I needed to go to the loo. I would like call her to come with me and back because I just could not be alone. Um, Though I've looked at Goodreads reviews and people say that it's not that scary but I thought it was absolutely terrifying. Um, So compared to other books that are similar to it um, that I've read would be something like The Upstairs Room by Kate Murray Brown, if anyone has read that. Um, Things like that where it's that kind of ambiguity I was saying about whether it is supernatural goings on or whether it's the people imagining it and the fear kind of being in you trying to figure that out. But I found this one to be a bit more closer to the traditional horror side than a lot of the others I've read like that. Um, because in books like The Upstairs Room, the weird things going on can be quite subtle. It can be like a person forgetting where they put things or acting out a bit, whereas in the apartment it's like they're finding buckets of human hair in the middle of the night. Like it's, you know, it's horrific imagery. Um, But it's definitely, the reason that I view this one as psychological horror is we do slowly reveal these secrets from the couple's past, and we discover that one of them in particular is going through this really intense grieving process. And so you are left with this ambiguity as to whether anything that happens actually is supernatural, whether it's in some of their, some of it is in their heads or some of it might be done by them because their psychological state is kind of driving them to this terrifying behavior or is it a combination of both? Um, And I really love not knowing because I usually think that the scariest answer is if none of it at all was supernatural. That's the most terrifying aspect for me, but I like when it's left open so you can be like, maybe a bit of it was or maybe it's like a circle like their like negative energy started these supernatural goings on and it drives them more insane so I like that kind of leaving it up to the reader a bit a rating for that one I would say freezer for that one because it like fully terrified me like some of the imagery that happens in the middle of the night was giving me nightmares but I just I will say it with the caveat that the Goodreads ratings, a lot of people said that they didn't think it was scary. So it was a freezer for me, but maybe not for everyone. <laughs> I mean, ratings are subjective to each reader. So. Yeah. It sounds like pretty crazy, though. Yeah, I thought it was. <laughs> um, so that was The Apartment by S.L. Gray. It has a little bit in common with my last pick, which is Come Closer by Sarah Gran. Um, this is the book that I was talking about that is a books in the freezer favorite a lot of people have talked about it like Rachel and I've had guests come on and have this as their pick but it's technically never been my pick okay here we go the synopsis reads if everything in Amanda's life is so perfect then why the mood swings the obscene thoughts the urge to harm the people she loves what are those tapping sounds in the walls and who's that woman following her 
The mystery behind what's happening to Amanda is so frightening that it ought to carry a warning to readers. Um, it's set in New York and it's basically this woman and her husband and she starts to exhibit a lot of changes and she doesn't know if it's like something mental going on, like if she needs like psychological help or if she's possessed by a demon or some kind of force because she hears these like supernatural things. She hears this like tapping in the walls. She has all this like stuff that goes on that she can't explain and she doesn't know like did I just like black out and do it or I mean was I just possessed (laughs) and that's why I don't remember doing these things and it goes back and forth and it is such a like crazy little novella in the way that it goes and like her looking for help and her like relationship with her husband and just like the way the tension and the consequences to everything increase and it just like gets bigger and bigger and bigger I thought was done so well and there's a reason that this book has been recommended like a million times on this podcast. And I felt like it had to be mentioned on this episode. Like if it was going to be mentioned on any episode, it would have to be this one. So everyone is absolutely right. You need to read this. Um, I'm putting it in the freezer. It was just so perfectly paced and plotted. It scared the crap out of me because what does the world look like if you can't trust yourself? That sounds amazing either way it's not great yeah (laughs) like either outcome either reason behind everything it's not great um and yeah I just like absolutely loved it uh that was come closer by Sarah Gran that sounds brilliant that sounds like my favorite kind of book exactly what you're saying like you don't know which is the more terrifying option um it kind of makes me think I was actually thinking recently just like the last week I had the worst PMS mood swings and I literally at that point you start to feel sometimes you're like I wish I was being possessed by a demon because that would at least be a like (laughs) that would be an easier answer for what is going on rather than like why am I suddenly acting like this like I hope it's a demon rather than that this is just my brain (laughs) There's always that option. That yeah. Could be. <laughs> and that's like the the good answer. You're like, this is worrying if that's the good option for me. <laughs> um, so the final book that I am going to talk about is Misery by Stephen King. So I had not read this one before. I read it because when we very first talked on Twitter about this episode, you suggested this as one of the options that would be a good fit. And I'd never read it and always wanted to. So Misery is about a writer who is, uh, when the novel starts, he has already had this car accident and he wakes up in a woman's house. And it turns out, it's revealed quite quickly that he is being held captive there by a woman called Annie Wilkes, who is his biggest fan. She absolutely loves his novels, particularly the Misery novels, which is a series about a woman called Misery. And in the last book that he had written, he had just killed her off because he hated writing about this character. He wants to write something new but Annie Wilkes is not going to let that go. So she keeps him captive in her house and makes him write her a new misery novel. But it is absolutely terrifying. Um, The horror here, the psychological horror, is the completely unstable psychological state of his captor, Annie Wilkes, and this slow, dawning realisation that there is no way out of this situation because she flies into these rages. She is unstable enough that she becomes very aggressive, very impulsive, very cruel, but she also has got enough presence of mind to be able to keep him captive there and to be cautious about keeping him there because she knows she can't let him go because she would go to prison. So he has no choice. If he does what she says... She will then get what she wants, she'll get the novel, and then she'll be able to kill him. And if he doesn't do what she says, she will fly into a rage and kill him. So he doesn't have much of a choice, and he suffers a lot of um, physical and mental abuse at her hands. So it's a terrifying book. It's really good fun. I will say the portrayal of women is not the best in it, and the portrayal of mental illness is also less than ideal. Um... Which is actually interesting in general in the genre of psychological horror. I was going to ask you what you think about this, because often that requires using mental illness as or mental instability as a plot point 
um, and how to do that without contributing to quite a dangerous and outdated idea of mental illness, which I think in Misery, fun as it was, I don't know if it fell the right side of that line. It definitely does contribute to this image of just Annie Wilkes has mental health problems and therefore she is violent and aggressive, which is a rather dangerous idea to sell. I think that's definitely a pitfall that it can fall into. I think especially older horror books. I mean, we're talking about Psycho. He diagnoses himself very early as schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. And I think in horror a lot, we see a lot of the big twist being like dissociative identity disorder and like, oh, yeah. the killer was my other personality. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there are people that live with these mental illnesses that are fine. They are not uh, murderous psycho killers that go on rampages. So I think it's something if you're looking at older horror books, they are not done well. And <laughs> I think it is something that needs to be addressed and talked about. But I think with more modern books I think there is more of a look at nuance within that and being more fair in a portrayal of mental illness mm -hmm. yeah definitely yeah because this is an 80s book and yeah. you can tell even just like some of the very casual sexism that is thrown <sighs> in in like throwaway comments is just a lot <laughs> but um yeah it's it it still stands up as a very fun read so I'd rate this one as probably fridge overall because I wasn't like scared to go to the loo by myself while reading it <laughs> but there are like definitely moments I wanted to put it in the freezer especially towards the end when Annie Wilkes becomes more and more desperate to keep him there and mm. uh, there's like a scene I mean I don't want to give spoilers but she will stop at nothing to prevent him from getting away or being rescued and there are some rather gory moments. There was one page that I actually didn't read of this book because I realized it was getting very gory so I just handed the book to my husband and just said I need you to read the rest of that page <laughs> and then give it back to me and tell me if anything happens beyond what is obviously about to happen that I don't need to read the details of. <laughs> that is funny. I... I know this is like another huge blind spot for me, but it's another one where I feel like it's so in the cultural zeitgeist that we all like know kind of the story of misery and like mm -hmm. the character of Annie. But Stephen King does those like moments of body horror so well. Um, I just talked about on a recent episode, but I was listening to Gerald's game and that's about a woman who's like, that could have also been in this episode, but I talked okay. about it again way too much. Um, <laughs> but that's about a woman who's handcuffed to a bed and she has to try to find a way to get out of there. And um, just her attempts to get out involve a lot of body horror. And I think one scene in particular, I was listening on audio and I had to like steady myself on a surface because I was like, ah. Oh my God. <laughs> like, <laughs> like my legs turned to jelly. I was yeah. Like, ah. <laughs> oh man. So those have been our picks for psychological horror. <laughs> So, as is books in the freezer fashion, mm -hmm. Emma, what is your chilling obsession? What is something you've been enjoying in horror? Okay, so most recently, I just have been reading a lot of horror because it is October, it is spooky season, and I just read um, a book called Revenge by Yoko Ogawa, mm -hmm. which is a collection of short stories. Have you read it? Yes. It's brilliant. One, yeah. yeah, absolutely loved it. Um, so that's kind of my obsession at the moment. I was trying to read other things. I was trying to like filter out the short stories in amongst other things, but I just straight up got so addicted to them because they're, they're short stories, but they're all interlinked. And each new story gives you kind of context for the one that you've just read. So I just like absolutely could not put it down and also kind of want to reread it now. So that's why I feel like I'm still obsessed with it because it's one that like you want to read over and over again and get all of the different layers to it. Yeah, there was like a few and then you read it and you catch like snippets of like other stories and you're like, wait, that person was the person in this one. Okay. Yeah, 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 it's, it's great fun. And sometimes it's like, oh, that's a kind of alternate version of that person. Like it's it's that character if that character hadn't died. So it's like very, very weird. <laughs> I need to revisit that one. It's been a few years since I yeah. picked that one up, but I remember really liking it. It's a good one. Um, And a new books in the freezer tradition that we have started very recently is asking mm -hmm. our guests for a final girl song 
Yes. Okay. So I put a lot of thought into this. I kept having like very strange songs pop into my head and I was like, no, that's not right. Um, and then I was kind of just listening to like my old playlists on shuffle and a song came up and I was like, this is the one. And it's Bad Reputation by Joan Jett because I love that song because of the movie 10 Things I Hate About You because it's like in the opening scene and I always thought that Kat in that movie was just the coolest person ever. She would definitely be a final girl. And there's this Mm -hmm. like that hilarious opening scene where Kat's sister and her friends are in the car and I can't remember what they're listening to but some like pop music, they're listening to something fun, they're like hanging out with their friends and through Kat's eyes they're completely lame and shallow but they're just having fun, being excited to be alive. Then the camera just like pans slowly to the side and there's Julia Stiles in her car like looking like she's sucking on a lemon and listening to Bad Reputation (laughs) and I was always just like wow she is so cool and she would definitely be a final girl and she would kick ass and she would, that song would be playing. I love that, that is a perfect pick, I'll add that. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining me on this whole journey we went on. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for about inviting psychological me. horror. So Emma, where can people find you online? So I am on YouTube, Drinking By My Shelf. And you can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at Drink By My Shelf because drinking didn't fit. So that's the best I could do. <laughs> you got to do what you got to do with those handles. Exactly. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Books in the Freezer is a bi-weekly podcast. We post episodes every other Tuesday. You can find us on Twitter at Books Freezer Pod, on Instagram at Books in the Freezer. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash books in the freezer. There's also a Books in the Freezer Facebook group if you want to join that. If you like what we're doing here at Books in the Freezer and you want to show your support, there are a lot of ways to do that. One of those is to support the show on Patreon and you can get a lot of cool stuff like early episodes, input into episode and episode topics. You can use our Amazon link to buy yourself some fun little doodads. You can go on Libro FM and support not only us, but a local bookstore using code FREEZERBOOK. But you don't have to spend any money to support the podcast. You can spread the word on social media about us, share on your Insta stories, tweet about us. Spreading the word is huge to small indie podcasts like this. And if you can take a moment to rate and review on a platform like Apple Podcasts or whatever you use, doing that helps us gain more visibility and rank and get more people to get their eyes on us. So thank you to all of you who have already done that. As always, I'm Stephanie. You can find me on Twitter at Lady underscore Ganya. That's L-A-D-Y underscore G-A-G-N-O-N. Or on Instagram at That's What She Read. That's That's with two A's. Or on YouTube at That's What She Read. See you next time on Books in the Freezer. Mm-hmm.